transfer to software engineers, technologists, and these kind of guys. Okay? So that's, that's what we're talking about. So this one uh, is from a guy called Mark Whitley, um, and he says, I'll sit down and work on an assignment, start sketching screens or composing an outline, and then suddenly stop and say to myself, these are all hows. Okay, this is how. Where's the what? Okay, what am I really trying to deliver? There's an implicit what for the line of most software projects. And I defy anybody to, to not, anybody, anybody who's done professional software engineering to not see this, to not see the truth of this. We just sit down and start sketching out systems on the backs of you know, napkins and you know, whiteboards and all that kind of stuff. But actually, we're not quite sure what the hell it is we want yet. Okay? And, it's, and, and it, it seems like we're, it's very, Seductive to just go straight into the house because it, it feels like we're making progress. Oh, I'm sketching screen time, mocking up a prototype, I'm doing something. Okay, but it seems like progress. And I suppose if you've got a manager saying to you, we need progress, we need to do something, we need to do something, it feels like progress, right? You're coming in, you're doing what you have to do, you're doing whatever you're designing, you're building this stuff. But actually, you don't know what you're doing, you haven't got the what yet. Okay, so the first part of this is how do you get the what's? Uh, addressing the what's, and the next next week's first lecture will be about the hows. Okay, so there's a number of frameworks, although there are some frameworks, and there's more than there's more than this, obviously, right? There's far more than this. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a number of, of ways to try and get frameworks to get this information. And these are really computer sciencey sort of uh, frameworks that are quite flexible. And so the circular kind of, the, the way that this is a circle, looks a lot like it would fit into an agile method, or it would be an iterative method, right? But this is how we sort of do it. And this is the awareness understanding action by uh, Cato. Okay, and this pretty much says that we know we've got some information, but we need to understand the purpose. And we go down this thing, we go, choices, what are the choices? We have an action, and that action allows us to build a system, in this case, we can our website, we can talk about anything and then we have this awareness. What do people think about that? What does it mean? And then we have an understanding about where we've screwed up, okay, or where we've done where we've done well. And then we move back to the purpose again. Eventually, we can split out this loop and can come up with an outcome. Okay. But oftentimes we keep iterating this loop. So we go through getting user knowledge and finding if they're satisfied. Getting user knowledge, finding if they're satisfied. This is what we're pretty much trying to teach in this course. Get user knowledge, find out if they're satisfied. Okay? It's not necessarily about whether you're satisfied, it's about whether they're satisfied. Okay? That's the whole point of it. Now, who thinks everything I'm saying is really just obvious? Come on. You must, some of you must think it's obvious. <coughs> Surely. Okay, so it is obvious. It's kind of obvious. But the other thing you need to know is that we get this wrong all the damn time. Okay, so it's very obvious, but we get it wrong. Right? In more cases than we get it, and then we get it right. So that's why I'm impressing this on you. It's very simple. If you, if you think nothing else, get the knowledge, find out if it's satisfied. Get the knowledge, find out if it's satisfied. We keep moving it okay, into developed systems. Yes? So what, what is the problem? Why do people want to do this? Because I'd rather go. Well, first, we're going to see this. There's a, there's a bit at the end which is about this in the real world, okay? So there's, there's reasons why it's going to be credited. One of the reasons is a thing called, that we call predetermined outcome. In a project, you've got managers, they, they, who's seen Gantt charts and curve charts and all this kind of stuff where they've got these kind of Gantt charts of, of how the system's going to work? So people are talking about, yeah, okay. That doesn't look very much like, like Agile to me. It just looks like this long, long string of stuff, right? And so, 
when you've got a project manager, that project manager has to find out how this project is going to go in gap jobs, in flip jobs, very linear, a lot like the multiple. But we know that that means there's no room to iterate. Okay, very little. So the reason why we get it wrong is because in a lot of occasions, there's a pretty turbid outcome. They, they don't even think about user testing or asking the users. They just want to get straight to the technology. And at the end, <coughs> they want you to enact a piece of, a piece of experimental work or an evaluation such that you prove that they're right. It's a pretty turbid outcome. That's what they want. And that's what's built into the plan. Okay? So that's why it fails, because there's nothing about asking users at the start to start to just build. And at the end, they expect the users to like it. Because that's what it says on the gap chart. And you can't overrun the gap chart. Okay? So if you overrun the gap chart, you're losing money, and then everything's gone. Okay? So you must finish it the gap chart. Now, there's seven of these different outcomes that we'll get to later on in the course. Okay? But, but that's one of the reasons. That there's really, in the real world, nobody cares about this. What they care about, if, you, if you're very lucky and you're a user experience person, you'll be consulted to start with. You'll have the ability to do this user knowledge stuff. But the vast majority of times, they just want you to go in and confirm that they're right. Okay? The only input you're going to get is bad plays, and you'll know that it's a bad place by this, is that you're brought in at the end. To say, oh, we've evaluated it with the implied assumption that it's going to be okay. Yeah? That's it. So I think you can actually you can actually decide how good your company is or how much seriously take, they're taking this at least by whether you're brought in at the start. And if you're not, Expect, they're, they're expecting you to just look at it and say it's good. Due diligence, due diligence has to be performed. Okay, that's what they're expecting. Okay, we also have this other, other sub loop which uh, Kato talks about, which is this, which is really this discover, then we design it, then we put it into use, and then we discover more from the use, and we change the design and we put it into use again. Again, agile. Okay, it's this agile, it's kind of this agile circle. So it's like agile for the user experience in a lot of ways. Okay? So that's what I'm trying to get across in this. Okay, you've got this sub bit as well, where you've got the explore. You know, what are the objectives? What, what objectives do we have? Oh, explore those objectives. What choices do we then have? And that's not just about the objectives, it's about things like resources, it's about things like time, it's about things like um, equipment. Okay, and outcomes and acceptable failures. Okay, because they're all there. There's lots of acceptable failures that people have. Okay. And then we design it, and then we evaluate it. And we keep going through this. Does the evaluation meet our objectives? Or has something from the objectives been lost and missed it? Okay? And that's normally not thought about. So that's what I'm trying to say to you. These three things you need to think about. Okay. So what is user-centered design? User-centered design is something that's quite, or participatory design, it's something that's quite, um, it's all the moment, shall we say. It's all the moment not just in user experience as you, as you might think about it, but it's also the moment in user experience as you think about healthcare. So health, HCI, healthcare, health systems, health informatics, they all have um, patient, public, and this is exactly like user centered for participatory design, but from this response. And the idea is we put this together. Okay? We put people with developers and designers at the start of the cycle so that the users are involved at every stage. Okay? So that they are participants in the design, not subjects or subject to it. Okay? So that they can feel that they've got a say. Okay? So that's, the, that's, that's what participatory design is about. It's what people want. Now it sounds easy, right? It sounds dumbass easy. But this was only invented not, you know, not, not that long ago in HCI. We only even thought about that long ago in HCI. Actually talking to users, good God. Why would we do that? So it might seem, it might seem obvious, but it's, it's not. Yeah. But it wasn't. And so what we're going to see is that in most of this, most of the next slides, we're going to talk about how users are involved in this thing. How do we get user knowledge? 
can't just participate in design. The idea is that you're not trying to think about the user as another as, as a separate thing or lower than you because you're the technologist and they're just reviewing and they have to get on with it. Okay? You're trying to do what Jeff Raskin says, which is you want to you want them to do no learning in your system to accommodate all of their needs. And you can only do that by asking them what their needs are. Okay, and involving them in that. Now again, it sounds obvious. It sounds straightforward. But this isn't how it is in the real world. Okay, so it isn't straightforward. You'll see this in the real world when you go out there. It's not like this. Okay? They don't want users to be involved. Because why don't want users to be involved? You get this too many opinions. That's what you get. Yeah. Other ones. money to do this. And it costs money to do it with lots and lots of different participants. You know, participants are expensive. User experience stuff is expensive, which is why as user experience people, you'll be getting paid quite a lot of cash, actually. Okay, because, you know, if I wanted to enact the user experience study, the user study, and I want to test maybe six to eight people and hire my and hire the lab, then that's about twelve thousand quid a day. That's how much it costs. That's how much I would have to pay. If I was just sitting there, if I was a, a, a commercial organisation. So even for our little user experience like, you know, we're charging, and we, we, don't, we're try, we try to make not a profit on that. We don't, uh, we don't get participants, and we don't do anything else. We just rent out the lab part. No, no, no other bits and pieces. You know, we're charging two to three thousand a day. Because it's expensive equipment and expensive, uh, expensive knowledge of how to use equipment. So it's, it, you know, it costs money. And some people don't want to do this. They want to, they think they want to know. They don't want to know. Yes. Okay, so who, who do you have to think about? So are, are people um, in software engineering, have you ever seen these kind of terms before? User expert in, in sort of software engineering and business -y stuff? Anybody seen this before? Yes, a few people. Good, 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 good. Okay, so generally we've got actors, stakeholders, uh, we've got people who are in executing roles, and we've got proxies. So the only thing here that you probably does anybody know what a proxy is? So yeah, it's someone who pretends to be. Uh, yeah, proxy is somebody who pretends to be somebody else. Now, proxy is an interesting one because sometimes it's seen as a bad thing to do because. Obviously, pretending to be somebody else is good then. It's good at peace. Um, other times it's seen as a, as a reasonably good thing to do, uh, certainly at uh, places like the, um, the uh, Centre for Aging at the University of Dundee, they have actors who come and dress up as old people, make up and everything, and kind of hobble about doing weird things in various scenarios, while those software engineers go, ooh, that's interesting, I didn't know that was the case. Okay, so generally they don't get old people to do it, they get actors. Such that software engineers can kind of get the idea, get the experience of what is what the physical and health conditions are in that context. So that's a proxy as well. Okay, so here we're going to have a five-minute break. It's not even a break; it's the bit where you're talking to each other or doing the thing. So don't look at the notes. Do not look at the notes, or you'll lose the learning experience. And there's, you know, you're not going to be tested on it, I'm not going to be marking you. Five minutes, you've got five minutes to decide what. Okay, what? What do we want? What are we going to do? We've got these stakeholders. Okay, so let's skip this one, then we can maybe do the next one so we want to. So, what is it that we want? Current systems, this is what we want to look at. So what resources are there for these, these stakeholders, for these stakeholders? What resources are, resources are there for you to get? The first thing is current system. What does the current system, paper-based or not, do? Okay, that's the first thing. What does the current system do? So you can, if you've already got a current system that's working, 
then you could, or even a current system that's a um, that's a paper-based system, you can actually find out how that system works by just looking at it. Also, most systems are documented. So, has everybody seen, does uh, everybody know the BS 5750? British Standard 5750. The British Standard 5750 is a way that companies enact a procedure, a procedural way of doing things. Okay? So, to get this level of quality assurance, you need to have a procedure for everything. Okay? So, the mistakes aren't made. And, you can, and from that documentation, you can understand the processes of the work, processes of the uh, company of the work that you're going to be doing or that you're going to be turning into computation and then, they, then you're able to uh, make it to algorithms much more effectively. Okay. Um, ISO 8001 as well. So improvements. So people will want to talk to you about what improvements they can make. So generally you've got this current system, you've got this current documentation and then there's anybody that tells you why that doesn't work. You know, why is it? What, you know, what's wrong with the paper-based system? What's wrong with the current documentation? Okay, why, is it, why is the procedure wrong? Why does it work properly? And that's the improvement that you've made. Okay, that's the lot part. Here it is. You've got subtractions here. This. Subtractions. These subtractions are important. Oftentimes, in lots of systems, there's things that were added that now are not wrong. Okay? Or there's different... Um, different regulatory frameworks which might not be necessary anymore but haven't been changed. Okay? You'll see this a lot in safety critical systems. So in safety critical systems, they're very worried about making change. Okay? So in flights, so the reason why you can't use your mobile phone in flight isn't because there's anything really going to happen with regard to your mobile phone uh, and these filters might or might not have. One of the main reasons why you can't use that, or the Wi Fi, etc., is that there's, there's certain regulations that talk about radio communication restrictions, what they are in flight, but then they might have an effect. The, the radio communication in general will have an effect on the way that the environment works, okay? But there's interference in the VHF. Okay? So that's a centrifugal system, and it's, and it's taken about 10 years or more for people to, to realize actually this is okay. We can Slap this off in the process. You can you know, put Wi Fi in the uh, uh, aircraft, it's not going to be a problem. Okay. But they're very reticent to subtract And then we've got importance. So, anybody heard of Moscow? The Moscow method? One, two, three, yeah, two people, okay, good. So, this kind of importance, Moscow works well with this. So, what's important? What's not important? What do we want to do? What don't we want to do? We'll get to Moscow in a bit anyway. You know, how does this work? So what is useful and what isn't useful? What needs speed? What's important? You've got a schedule that you need to enact. Okay, there's always a schedule. So you've got to order things into priorities. Okay, how? How should this be done? So this is your next five minutes, right? And this is one thing three. How do we collect this information? Okay, so that's the first, so that's the next one. How do we collect the information? <coughs> In groups, or if you're a singleton on your own, because you hate everybody and you're all biases, then you can do it on your own if you like. It's easy to do it. And